Let's take a look now at arguably the most difficult problem from your chapter 19 homework. This is number 59. I like to call it the dry ice bomb problem, even though it's really not about dry ice. Dry ice, of course, is solid carbon dioxide, which sublimates into gaseous CO2 at atmospheric pressure. But the, uh, the problem is very similar to a dry ice bomb. So in a moment, I'll show you a little news, um, news release about, I guess a while back, there was a, a rash of people getting injured with dry ice bombs. So let's talk about what that is first. That dry ice, pressurized in a container, can be deadly. When you contain it, let's say a, a Coke bottle or something like that, and you add a fluid to it, you accelerate that pressure significantly, and you just it will just slowly keep building and building and building until boom, it's just going to explode. A bomb, essentially. Yeah. Oh yeah. And though some consider it an innocent prank, police call it a crime that could have deadly consequences. For Good Morning America, Abby Boudreau, ABC News, Los Angeles. A crime, huh? That seems a little reactionary. Well, I, sh I chose to share that particular video because it had that nice graphic there of the uh, the dry eye sublimating, and you could you could sense that the pressure was increasing drastically within the bottle. So in this problem, uh, we're not looking at carbon dioxide contained in a, a volume. We're talking instead about nitrogen, liquid nitrogen. So I'm gonna write all this stuff out on, on the paper here, but we're told that the, the volume of the thermos is 2,000 milliliters. Well, remember, 1,000 milliliters is one liter. So in other words, we're talking about a two liter bottle, which is familiar to us. And they tell us that we start out with 500 milliliters of liquid nitrogen inside the bottle. 500 milliliters. That would be one fourth of the volume of the bottle. So this line represents liquid nitrogen below and gaseous nitrogen above. Now, we know that there has to be a gaseous nitrogen filling this bottle because if suppose there were no gas at all in here, well, no particles at all would mean my recording, yes, would mean no pressure. Pressure comes from the collisions of all those, those particles with uh, a boundary. So if there were no pressure here, wouldn't more of this liquid nitrogen immediately evaporate? So there has to be gaseous nitrogen in order to provide the pressure that, that keeps the two phases in equilibrium. So let's look at the phase diagram for nitrogen. I hope this is accurate. I pulled it up off the web. And we'll, we'll go way, uh, way down here to one uh, atmosphere of pressure. Uh, over here it says bar A. I think that means uh, one bar of pressure. Basically one bar is one atmosphere. There, there's slightly different definitions. But if I draw a horizontal line, um, every point on this red line would be at a constant pressure of one atmosphere. As we raise the temperature up to, I believe the, uh, the book says 109, negative 196 degrees Celsius, that is when nitrogen would be in phase equilibrium between the liquid and gaseous phase. So right here at negative 196 Celsius, also known as 77 Kelvins, and one atmosphere of pressure, uh, we've got liquid and gas in phase with each other. You know, we're, we're more familiar with water, which has to be way over here at uh, positive 100 degrees Celsius before it evaporates wildly different behavior, right? Water switches from liquid to gas at 100 degrees Celsius. Nitrogen will do that at a much colder temperature, way down at negative 196. And I'm sure that has something to do with the fact that uh, water is a polar molecule, so there are weak attractions between molecules, and you're gonna have to get them moving way faster before they break apart from each other. On the other hand, nitrogen, uh, I'm not even very familiar with, with its properties as a liquid. I don't know if it's a diatomic molecule or just atoms of nitrogen, but there's probably very little interaction between the, the atoms, and so it's not difficult to separate them. Okay, so we're just keep in mind that within the bottle, we're right here, not at the triple point, but at, at a particular point on the uh, equal, what is it, phase equilibrium curve between liquid and gas. Okay, and the premise of the problem is that some student in this lab sees a little chunk of iron sitting on their table and it's marked. I think it's 197 grams 
and they say, hey, how about I just chuck this into the bottle, uh, seal it, and see what happens? And in real life, you would not want to do that because we're going to see that the pressure inside skyrockets, just like it did in the, the brief graphic you saw for the dry ice bomb. So this is a little different from the dry ice bomb because usually with the dry ice bomb, you don't throw a solid object in to warm up the carbon dioxide. Usually you would just seal it and let, let the, you know, sunlight or ambient temperature uh, cause the, the sublimation. But the idea is this, uh, everything in here, before you, you drop in the iron, everything in here is at 77 Kelvin. that's super cold. But this chunk of iron was sitting out at room temperature. So this thing has quite a bit of thermal energy. When you drop it into the bottle, uh, remember heat always flows from warmer objects to colder objects. This thing, where'd it go? I need my laser pointer here. This thing is much warmer than, than everything else in the bottle. So heat will immediately begin to flow from here into the bottle. Now, you've already got uh, phase equilibrium between liquid nitrogen and gaseous nitrogen. So any additional heat that flows into this substance will do what? Is it gonna raise the temperature of any of it? Remember, if you were to raise the temperature of the gas, of nitrogen, the gas would now be warmer than the liquid. The liquid is at 77 kelvins. What if you, what if the heat that flowed out of this iron were to raise the temperature of the gas to 78? Well, now if the gas is 78 and the liquid 77, wouldn't you now have fl heat flowing back from the gas into the liquid? So you can't actually establish a temperature difference between the two phases. They will stay the same phase. Oh, excuse me, they will stay, stay at the same temperature. So the heat that, that's flowing into the liquid, what does it do to the liquid? Again, it's not going to raise the temperature of the liquid, it will cause it to change phase. And since we're going from uh, liquid to gas, that's like boiling, we need the, the heat of vaporization, that capital L. So we're gonna figure out how much heat flows out of the iron and ask ourselves, how, uh, how much of the liquid will be boiled by that quantity of heat? And before we get into the calculations, let me say something else about that. Uh, we're gonna need to know the temperature change for the iron. If we're gonna use MC delta T for the iron to figure out how much heat it gave up, we need to know uh, what its final temperature is. So do you think the iron is gonna go from 20 degrees, that's um, room temperature, down to, I don't know, zero degrees Celsius? negative 10, or will it go all the way down to uh, negative 196, or in other words, 77 Kelvin? Ask yourself which of those two scenarios is likely. Well, if this thing doesn't drop all the way down to the 77 Kelvins, if it doesn't do that, that means it's still warmer than everything else in the bottle. And if that were the case, heat would continue to flow from the iron into the liquid and its temperature would continue to drop. So remember, everything has to meet at some common temperature at the end. And it seems unlikely to me that this small quantity of iron with a small heat capacity could successfully boil all of, of the uh, liquid nitrogen because we've only got 196 grams here, but we're talking about 500 milliliters of liquid nitrogen. So I think it's safe to assume at the outset that it's gonna boil some of it, but not all of it. And then at the end, everything will be at a common equilibrium temperature of 77 Kelvins. And that's what's so useful about liquid nitrogen is if you have enough of it, you can, you can bring, you know, if, whatever you drop into it, you can bring the whole thing down to that common temperature. So you know what that temperature is and it's very low. We are going to need the volume of that chunk of iron because we have to know how much, uh, how much gaseous nitrogen is displaced by the iron when we drop it into the bottle. So knowing that the sample is 197 grams and you could look up the density of iron in the table, remember water is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, so iron is considerably more dense. Uh, we, can take the, um, we can take the mass in kilograms, use SI units, and divide into that the density in order to calculate the volume. You can always get this formula by just looking at how the units work out or try to reason through it you know, with your common sense. 
uh, if there are this many kilograms for every one cubic meter, ask how many times this many kilograms goes into that many to figure out how many cubic meters you're talking about. Yeah, that probably didn't help you at all, did it? But let's see what we're talking about here. Obviously, it's, it's a number much less than one. Which makes sense because it's just a teensy little chunk of metal, and that's much less than a cubic meter. So I find two and a half, I'll, I'll keep a couple digits, 2.50 times 10 to the negative fifth cubic meters. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I know that 10 to the negative sixth or one millionth of a cubic meter is what we call a milliliter. So I'm going to move the decimal place over by one to decrease um, the power of 10 by one. And I can write this as 26 milliliters since the other volumes are listed, not 26, 25, 25 milliliters. That'll be convenient since the other volumes are listed in milliliters. Okay, we know that the initial temperature for the iron was simply room temperature. And the final temperature, we're, we're assuming ahead of time that everything's going to, uh, to reach a common temperature of the, the liquid nitrogen temperature. We don't expect, remember, if, if the iron was large enough or hot enough for both, it could successfully boil all of the liquid nitrogen and still raise its temperature even higher. We don't expect that to happen because it's not particularly hot and it's a small chunk. So the final temperature of the iron, we assume, is negative 196 Celsius. That's the same as 77 Kelvins, but it would be more convenient probably to leave it like this because we're interested in delta T. We don't actually need to convert to Kelvins. Okay, now that we know um, the mass of the iron and its initial and final temperatures, all we need is the specific heat, and we can, we can calculate the heat given up by the iron. So the specific heat, look it up in the table, much less than the specific heat of water. Remember, water is 4190, so this is almost 10 times less. Okay, the heat given up by the iron. MC delta T, mass of the iron, and I should really use a capital M. Remember your book, they reserve lowercase m for the mass of an individual particle. Uh, capital M is for the whole chunk. And then I'll just say delta T for the iron. MC delta T. I'm sorry, that looks like an E. That's supposed to be a C. Let's stick with SI for everything. 0.197 kilograms times, well, every, every kilogram of iron requires 449 joules if its temperature is going to rise by one degree. But of course, we're rising by more than one degree. We've got negative uh, 196 minus 20. See how we're actually going to be plugging in a negative number? Q for iron comes out negative because the iron gave up energy. Energy is flowing out of the iron. So let me plug in those numbers and see what kind of energy we're talking about. Uh, let's see, I think I can do that in my head. 196 plus 20. Um, right. Why am I having a brain fart here? That's 206, 216, right? Okay, so 216 with the minus sign. And I get 19.106 kilojoules, negative 19.106 kilojoules. Well, remember four kilojoules is, um, I'm comparing with the solutions manual here. Four kilojoules is about one food calorie. So this is something like four or five food calories worth of energy. That's a considerable amount of energy for, for these smaller substances. Now we go to our basic calorimetry equation. The heat uh, absorbed by the nitrogen, so I'll put Q sub N. I'm putting N for nitrogen, even though the gaseous form is really N2, it's, it's molecular hydrogen. And does the book even tell you that, or are you just supposed to know that? I guess they assume you know that from basic chemistry. So I'm gonna put this. There's the heat that, that might flow into the nitrogen and raise its temperature, and then there's the heat that might flow into the nitrogen and 
cause a phase change. So I'll put L sub V for vaporization plus the heat for the iron, that's got to equal zero. We treat the bottle as a closed system. Yes, we might have an exchange of energy between the nitrogen and the iron, but they should not be exchanging heat with the surroundings. And since there's no net heat flowing in or out of the bottle, the sum of all those heats has to equal zero. Now, we've already established that there should not be any temperature change for the nitrogen. It's already at 77 kelvins, and it's not gonna get any warmer than that because there's not enough energy flowing out of the iron to completely boil the nitrogen. The nitrogen's gaseous temperature will not rise above 77 until all of the nitrogen is boiled. So we can cross that term out. And now we can set the, uh, the heat of vaporization equal to at least an absolute value to uh, the heat that flows out of the iron. Okay, so I'll put this. Uh, mass of nitrogen boiled times the latent heat of vaporization for nitrogen. It's, un it's understood this is for nitrogen. That's gonna equal the negative of the heat that flows out of uh, the iron. We just take the, uh, the opposite sign there. So positive 19.106 kilojoules. Okay, now we need to figure out um, how many, how many kilograms we're talking about here. No, that's what we're solving for. Right, we're solving for M. We need the, uh, the latent heat of vaporization. So for nitrogen, you would just look that up in the table. I believe that's in the chapter. So you can go back through the pages of the chapter and find that heat of vaporization. And we're told that it's 1.99 times 10 to the fifth joules for every kilogram. And if you compare that to water, I think in order to boil water, it's more like 22 instead of one. Well, this is basically two, right? Instead of two, it's more like 22 for water. So it may take a tremendous amount of energy to boil one kilogram of uh, nitrogen at 77 kelvins, but it still takes quite a bit more to boil water. Okay, so that's the number that you'd plug in here. Let's solve for M. And again, you can see it in the units. We've got 19.106 kilojoules, that's times 10 to the third joules to work with here, but it takes this many joules for every kilogram. So you can see, we're not even gonna boil one kilogram. Well, that's not surprising because I don't even think there is one kilogram of liquid nitrogen in the bottle. How many grams are we going to boil? Divided by 1.99, 10 to the fifth. Okay, so this is in kilograms. I'm gonna multiply by 1,000 to convert to grams. That's 96 grams of liquid nitrogen. Now, can I just assume that those 96 grams occupy a volume of 96 milliliters? No, because that's only true for, for water. You can only make that conversion. One gram of water has a volume of one milliliter for water uh, because water has that density, one gram per cubic centimeter. We need to use the density of liquid nitrogen in order to figure out how many how many um, milliliters we're talking about. Let's go with this relation between mass, density, and volume, but we're using it specifically for nitrogen. And I see your solutions manual used N2. But I think that's kind of inappropriate because I don't know if, if it's actually molecular nitrogen in the liquid form. So I'll just use N for nitrogen. The mass of nitrogen that we're, that we're talking about is density of nitrogen, liquid nitrogen times the volume, and we're solving for the volume. Why do we need the volume? Because we need to know what happens to the, we're gonna use the ideal gas law in a moment to find the new pressure. So we need to know the, the volume available now to that gas. Uh, so volume of nitrogen would be M over the density. Now we use the, the 96 grams that we just calculated. This is how many grams were, or underwent a phase change. And liquid nitrogen, you can look it up, has a density of 810 kilograms per cubic meter. That sounds reasonable because water is 1,000 and they're both liquids. So how many milliliters are we talking about? Um, we'll have to manipulate the power of 10. Every time I say power of 10, I think about this book that some of the students read when I was in like high school called The Power of One. Power of 10. Okay. One point... 
times 10 to the negative fourth cubic meters. Well, what I will do is move this decimal place two to the right and pay for it with another negative two or power, and uh, another two powers of negative. No, you don't. What am I trying to say? I'll just write it and that will be clear. That's 118.5 times 10 to the negative sixth cubic meters. In other words, 118.5 milliliters. I'm trying to keep everything in milliliters. Now we can move on to the ideal gas law stuff. Honestly, half the work is already done. So keep this picture in your head. Um, when they dropped this chunk of iron in, before they dropped it in, there were 500 milliliters of liquid, 1500 milliliters of gas for a total of 2000. But think about it, when the cap is open and you drop this chunk of iron in, in order for the, the iron to occupy space within the bottle, doesn't it have to push some of that gas out? So we don't actually have 1500 milliliters of gas before the thermal interaction. Um, some quantity of gas was pushed out or displaced. And that's why uh, I calculated, previously I calculated the volume of the iron. So let's take the 1500 for the gas and subtract whatever was displaced by the chunk of iron. Um, and I'll, I'll do this, for the, the, the gaseous nitrogen, which we know is diatomic, for N2, I'll say V initial was the 1500 milliliters minus, remember I already calculated the volume of that chunk of iron. We found that it was 25 milliliters. So 25 milliliters of nitrogen gas gets pushed out of the bottle right before it's sealed. Okay, so 1475 is what we're talking about originally for the gas. And then here's an, an easy thing to overlook. The final volume of the gas changes. I mean, I think it's clear to you that the number of moles of gas is increasing because a lot of the liquid's being boiled away to form gas. So obviously the number of gas particles is going up, but the volume that they have to occupy is also increasing slightly. Because when you look at the bottle, Previously, 500 milliliters of space were not available to the gas because they were taken up by the liquid, but now some of that liquid's gone, which opens up a little more space for the gas to occupy. And we just calculated that. That's why we were doing that. This many uh, milliliters of liquid are gone, so that many more milliliters are now available to be filled up by the gas. So the final volume of the nitrogen gas is gonna be the 1475 that it did have, after we dropped in the iron, plus the additional 118 and a half that's available because of the phase change from liquid to gas. So what are we talking about total? 1475 plus 118.5, 1593 and a half milliliters. Okay, so on the one hand, uh, the gas now has a slightly greater volume to occupy, so you might think that that would tend to reduce the pressure, and it does, but there's that much more significant effect that we expect due to dumping way more particles of nitrogen into that volume. So overall, we expect the volume to go up. We have two competing effects here, slightly greater volume, but way more moles. So that's the last thing we'd have to do is find the number of moles, because we're going to use ultimately the ideal gas law to figure out what the pressure is at the end. Well, I'm looking here, if we think about the initial state, so this is, by initial I mean, we've already dumped the, the ice in, excuse me, the iron. We've already dumped in the iron and sealed the bottle, but there hasn't been time yet for that thermal, thermal exchange to take place, so no phase change. Um, we, we were told that the pressure is atmospheric, and we know the volume, we just calculated that. We know the ideal gas law, and we know the temperature, that's the 77 kelvins, so great. We can calculate the number of moles of nitrogen gas originally. Okay, now, here's also a subtle point. Uh, the problem states that before the bottle was opened and the iron was dropped in, the pressure was atmospheric, one atmospheric pressure, or one atmosphere of pressure. And what you have to recognize is, that during the time it takes to unscrew the cap, open the, open the, or take the cap off, and drop the iron in, 
um, the inside of the bottle is at one atmosphere and the, the air outside the bottle within the room is also a one atmosphere of pressure. So there should not be any change in pressure within the bottle. If the bottle had already been at five atmospheres before you unsealed the cap and dropped in the iron, then as soon as you unseal the cap, you'd hear a big hiss and nitrogen would rush out and the pressure would drop very abruptly and, and reach the same value as the, the room, which would be one atmosphere. So that would be a further complication, but that's not what's happening here. So we can assume even after we've unscrewed the cap and dropped in the iron, the pressure inside, inside is still one atmosphere, uh, despite the fact that we've, we've actually displaced some of the nitrogen that was in there previously. So that's a bit of a subtlety. Again, you just make the assumption that the pressure is still one atmosphere because while the cap was open, it was exposed to the atmosphere and the atmosphere is at one atmosphere of pressure. So it's just gonna stay that way. Okay, so the number of moles of liquid nitrogen initially, so say number of moles initially for, not liquid nitrogen, sorry, for the gaseous nitrogen, because this is the ideal gas law. We cannot apply this to the liquid. It's only applied to the gas. We would take the uh, pressure initial times volume initial, over our T initial. And of course, I could put subscripts N2, N2, but it's understood I'm talking about the gaseous nitrogen here. Well, one atmosphere, let's do SI units. That's uh, 1.013, I believe, times 10 to the fifth pascals. And the volume, we've got a number of volumes running around here. Which one are we talking about? Well, it was the, it was the 1500 that we started with minus the 25 displaced by the iron. So here's the initial. That's 1475. I'm sorry, I ran out of space here. 1475 times 10 to the negative sixth, because it's milliliters. That's a millionth of a, a milliliter is a millionth of a cubic meter. Divided by 8.31. And remember, you must use Kelvins in the ideal gas law. Must use absolute temperature, 77. Kelvins. Okay, so I've got more space on the next page. Let's see how many moles we're talking about. Do we expect 100 moles? Not in a two liter bottle. 1.013, 10 to the fifth times 1475 millionths divided by 0.31 divided by 77. I find that the number of moles initially, initial number of moles for nitrogen gas is 6.2, I'll round it to 6.26. Yeah, evidently that was just a calculator error. I tried again with the same numbers and I got the correct answer, less than one mole. This makes sense to me because remember, if you're talking about carbon, carbon for instance, one mole of carbon-12 is just a little mound of dust in the palm of your hand. You know, it's about, it's about that tall, but that's a solid. So a mole of gas, in a gas the particles are way further apart. You would expect a mole of a gas to occupy a rather large volume, certainly larger than a two liter bottle. So it's no surprise that um, since we're talking about a volume of gas less than a two liter bottle, we're talking about less than one mole. Okay, if I go back to the ideal gas law, um, <clears throat> what was I even doing here? Right, so we'd like to know the pressure at the end. The whole point of this problem is to what value does the pressure skyrocket in uh, inside that bottle? That's the interesting number. If we want to evaluate this after the phase change, after heat has flowed from the iron into the liquid nitrogen and caused a phase change, uh, we need to know all of these quantities after, with the exception of pressure, because we're going to solve for pressure. We need the volume after, the number of moles after, and the temperature after. Well, the temperature is easy because remember, everything is still at 77 kelvins. There's enough nitrogen in phase equilibrium between liquid and gas that that's not gonna change. So the, the final temperature is still 77 kelvins. That was easy. Now the, the final volume, I believe we already calculated that. Remember, after dropping in the ice and displacing those 25 milliliters, we started out with this many milliliters available to the gas, but some of the liquid underwent a phase change, opening up an additional 118.5. So this would be the final volume of gas. Of course, that'll have to be entered in SI units, 1593 and a half 
So I will convert that when the time comes. What else do we need in the ideal gas law? We need the number of moles at the end. Okay. Well, you've still got this many moles floating around inside the bottle as gas, but we have an additional number of moles due to the amount of uh, nitrogen mass that underwent a phase change. 96 grams of liquid nitrogen turned into uh, 96 grams of gaseous nitrogen. And we need to figure out how many moles that is, because it's the number of moles that appears in in our version of the ideal gas law. So I'm gonna use this equation. Total mass is number of mass times mass per mole. So since we know the total mass of nitrogen that underwent the phase change, that's 96 grams, if we just knew the molar mass, we could calculate the number of moles. Well, for, for N2, for nitrogen gas, it's diatomic. Um, this isn't a chemistry lesson. I wouldn't be equipped to give you a, a chemistry lesson anyway, but we're talking about N14, at least for the atom, because nitrogen, if you look at the periodic table, it's got seven protons and its most common isotope would have seven neutrons as well. So this is the atomic mass number of nitrogen, the atom, but uh, under normal, uh, in a normal range of pressures, Nitrogen gas is diatomic. So there's two of these stuck together. So if you want a little silly picture, each of these has 14 nucleons for a total of 28 nucleons. And remember, I tried to emphasize in that one video, one mole of nucleons has a mass of one gram. So a mole of 28 nucleons would have a mass of 28 grams. Simple as that. So the mass per per mole would be 28 grams. It's, it's so easy that you might forget it, but you just, however, whatever the atomic mass number is, that's the same as the mass in grams of one mole. And I know I haven't talked much about the atomic mass unit. It used to be abbreviated AMU, now it's just a lowercase u. That is the mass of one nucleon, you know, a proton or a neutron. We know that technically, those are slightly different, but for, for our purposes, we don't care about this, the tiny difference. So this is the mass, one U is the mass of uh, one nucleon, and that's something like, what is it, 1.66 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. You don't actually need that in this problem, but the mass of one nucleon is that tiny fraction of a kilogram. Okay, so let's solve for the number of moles of nitrogen. That would be N final for nitrogen gas. We take the mass we're talking about, 96 grams. <clears throat> how do we calculate those 96 grams? That was using the heat of vaporization. We knew how much heat flowed from the iron into the liquid, and we used that to figure out how much would be evaporated. Uh, but there are 28 grams for every mole. So now we can easily determine how many moles got evaporated. Oh, you know what? This isn't final because we're gonna have to add this to what we already had. So I'll say moles boiled. 96 grams were boiled. That translates to 3.43, I call it. 96 grams were boiled, that's 3.43 moles. So the final number of moles occupying the volume within this bottle would be the original 0.2335 plus, and I realize I'm being a little inconsistent with sig figs here, but the final number of moles, it's considerably greater. I'll round to three digits, 3.66. Isn't that more than 10 times the number of moles that were originally there? So think about it, if, if the temperature is the same, that means each particle of Nitrogen gas is still zipping around with the same average kinetic energy, but you've got more than 10 of them. Isn't that way more pressure inside the bottle? And of course, to find out for sure, we say final pressure is NRT over V, and here's where I have to use SI units. 3.66 moles, ideal gas constant 8.31, 
And the final temperature, it must be in Kelvins. 77 is still the final temperature. But the final volume, <clears throat> we've already looked at that. That's that 159, does that say 159? Shouldn't that say 159? Or sorry, 1593.5. Yeah, that was a mistake. 1593.5. So I'm going to write that as 1593 and a half. Well, that's milliliters, and a milliliter is a millionth of the SI unit of volume, the cubic meter. Okay. Uh, this is going to come out in Pascals, and we, we would probably like to see the pressure in atmospheres, so we'll convert once more at the end. 3.66, 8.31, 77 divided by 1593.5 millionths. And, oh, I just hit clear. Let me pause. Here's the pressure in Pascals, and you, you'll notice that the power of 10 is one higher than, than uh, an atmosphere, because an atmosphere is 1.01 .01 times 10 to the fifth. So convert from Pascals to atmospheres, and I find we're talking about 14 and a half atmospheres. Your book rounded to 15. Okay, so depending on what your thermos is made out of, it may not be able to withstand those pressures or that pressure inside and it could just explode. It probably would if it were a two liter bottle made out of plastic. And that's why, you know, they recommend that you don't do this with dry eyes. At the very least, if you're going to do it, like I'm not condoning it, but make sure you're very far away from the thing when it explodes. And I wouldn't do it in a driveway or anywhere in a neighborhood. It's got to be out in the middle of nowhere. And me personally, if I was going to be the one throwing the dry ice into the bottle and sealing it, I probably want to have some kind of face protection on and earplugs just in case it went off before I got to a safe distance. All right, but hey, why not just watch it on YouTube? It's high definition anyway, slow motion, and zero risk of bodily harm. That's, uh, that's my solution.